Hi, welcome to The Physical Educator. Today we're going to talk about joint and movement type. But before we start, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell for notifications. You can also follow us on Twitter at PEducator for academic PE and sports science updates. Joint and movement type, let's have a look at the syllabus outline first. Only five objective points in this unit. The first two require you to go into brief detail above an identification. So therefore types of muscular contraction, types of movements and where, that's the outline. The last three topic points are looking for more detail than that. So make sure you pay attention in the video and we'll go through the explanations and analysis required. So there's many movements available around the body. Some familiar, through previous science experience, maybe IB, MYP studies, or GCSE PE. So we're gonna start with our more obvious ones, and we'll include the more obscure ones as we go through. Flexion, something we've all heard of. It gets its name from flexing your muscles. Now when you do flex your muscles, as you can see, it comes in. Because you're not flexing your muscles, you're causing flexion at the elbow to do that. So flexion takes place at two different joints, really, for us. The hinge joints and the ball and socket joints. As you can see on the screen, now we've got our hinge joints. Nice and simple, we know flexion at the knee and the elbow. This is what it looks like. We also have flexion at the ball and socket joints, which is the hip and the shoulder. Now, as you can see in the examples, note that the leg and the arm moves forward. So an easy tip for you to remember here, flexion is forwards. This is flexion, moves forwards, nice and simple. Moving on next into extension. Now, extension and flexion are at two ends of the range of movement. So the two separate movements within one range. If you flex, well, you have to go back to your start position, so therefore you have to extend. Without that, you'd flex once and you'd be stuck. And therefore, extension happens. So extension is the opposite of flexion. It, at the, the hinge joints, it looks like this, where we are extending at the knee and the elbow, and at the shoulder and the hip, if we're in flexion, extension can bring us back, to stationary or further, hyperextension, further than the range backwards. Our next range of movement is abduction to adduction. Again, two ends of the range of movement. Now, abduction is as it sounds, it's abducting your arm and your leg away from your body. But there's a key change here between flexion extension and abduction and adduction. And that's the direction of the movement. Flexion and extension works forwards and backwards in this plane of motion here. Whereas when we're looking at abduction and adduction, we're now looking at lateral movement sideways. So abduction and adduction, you need to pretend that there's a dotted line down the middle of your body and abduction is taking it away from the midline. Like these examples here, this is how you abduct. Just like I said with flexion, once the muscles have caused that movement, you need to come back in. So, adduction is adding your arms and adding your legs back to the midline of your body. So a neat, nice and easy one to remember here. Abduct is taking them away, just like being abducted, and adduction is just like addition adding to the body. Next, we're gonna discuss rotation and circumduction. Two completely different movements, however, ones that can easily get confused. Circumduction is a combination of flexion, extension, abduction, and adduction. And it's when you draw a big circle with your arm or a big circle with your leg, at your hip and your shoulder. The difference between circumduction and rotation is on the screen now. So this side is circumduction, as I've just explained. Look at the difference on this side when we're looking at rotation. The difference is the joint rotates as opposed to going through the other range of motion to create a movement. Rotation's key in certain sports, for example, to, to help with this analogy for understanding. You pass a football, well, you get advised not to use your toe. So what you do is you rotate your hip to open up your foot to play that pass. That's rotation that's taking place at the hip. If you're swimming and you're doing a backstroke, you rotate at the top for your little finger to enter the water first. If you're a spin bowler in cricket, you will rotate your shoulder as the ball releases from your hand. Some examples there of rotation. Circumduction, butterfly technique, is an example for circumduction. We also have elevation and depression, and this is referring to the neck. So when you elevate, your shoulders come up, 
your trapezius muscles are contracting at the back to cause this movement to happen. And then we allow them to depress and come back down. Elevation and depression. So dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Got two flexions at both ends of the range of movement here. And that goes against our previous learning of flexion and extension. So what's important here is the words that accompany it. Plantar flexion, dorsiflexion. Plantar is when you go up on your tiptoe. So on this side now, and this is a movement every time you walk, every time you run, every time you jump, you go up onto your tiptoe. But like with every movement, you need an opposite movement working antagonistically to bring you back to the start. And that is dorsiflexion. You can also dorsiflex from a start position. So it doesn't just have to bring a plantar flexion back to rest. It can also go from rest to dorsiflex, which is something like a ski jumper, as they have to really push forward with the modern technique to stay under the air resistance to get as much distance as possible. Slightly more obscure movements, eversion and inversion, and we're looking at the ankle here. When you roll your ankle, a very, very common injury in sport, and you end up with a twisted ankle. That's an inverted position that you are in. The inside line of your foot, your big toe, is pointing inwards towards you. So it's inversion. Example here, eversion is when your big toe and inside of your foot starts to move outwards, looks like this. And you can also feel it as a bit of a stretch on your medial ligament on the inside of your knee. And that's eversion. So inversion when you roll your ankle and your foot comes in even though you fall outwards. And eversion when the inside line of your foot points outwards and the outside of your foot is slightly elevated off the ground. That's eversion. So as you can see on the screen, we've got pronation and supination. Pronation is where the palm of your hand faces the sky. Supination is where the palm of your hand faces the floor. Now, an easy thing to remember here is top spin. So if you need to provide sporting examples for pronated position or a supinated position, just think about top spin. If it's a forehand top spin, you're providing a movement that's moving from a pronated position to a supinated position. Your hand starts facing upwards. As you impact the ball, you then rotate your wrist and your palm of your hand faces the floor. The opposite of this is if you're to do a backhand topspin, where you start off in a supinated position and as you impact the ball, you rotate your wrist. So therefore, your palm of your hand now faces the sky, which is a pronated position. So topspin, either forehand and backhand, takes you through the range of moving from pronated to supinated on a forehand or supinated to pronated on a backhand. 4.2.2 wants us to look at the different types of muscular contraction. We have isotonic, isokinetic and isometric. Concentric and eccentric contractions are both examples of isotonic contractions. So let's get stuck straight into it to make sense of all of this. Let's start with isotonic contractions. Now, we have concentric or eccentric, and let's look at them words themselves. Concentric sounds similar to constrict, concede, anything like that where we are reducing. And eccentric, elastic, lengthening of the muscle. So let's look at what that looks like. Up here, we have an example of a concentric muscular contraction. As you can see, the muscle is contracting as the joint angle is decreasing, as the muscle is shortening. That's a concentric muscular contraction. To be technical, it's a concentric isotonic contraction. We also have a eccentric isotonic contraction. And that is where the muscle is under stress whilst it is lengthening. So it is still, as you can see in this image now, the bicep is still the prime mover. Even though it looks like the elbow is extending, which our knowledge would say, oh, that's extension, that's the tricep that's working. But it's not, it's the bicep that is eccentrically contracting. Try this exercise yourself and see where you feel the burn in your muscle. It will be in your bicep as it's eccentrically contracting. Next, we have isometric contraction, same dimensions. So with this contraction, there's no movement at the joint. There's no shortening or lengthening of muscles under tension. They stay at the same dimension, the same length during tension, whilst they are contracting. And an examples of isometric contractions are up on the screen now. We have the plank, we have a ski sit, and we also have holding out dumbbells in a T position. 
Isokinetic is the most uncommon type of muscular contraction because it's not necessarily a natural type. However, there is research to suggest that if you can access the technology of isokinetic contraction, you can experience significant strength gains. It can also help increase the speed of recovery rate from injury as well. So there definitely is a purpose for isokinetic, it just isn't accessible to everybody. And having the right equipment and the right specialist professional to, to assist with your recovery or your strength gain is required. But isokinetic, we're looking at the same movement. So throughout the movement, the pressure and the stress on the muscle is the same. Whereas if you're to exercise yourself, let's say do a bicep curl, at different parts of your bicep curl, there is a peak in pressure and stress on the muscle, and then there's a low in stress and pressure on the muscle. Whereas isokinetic is a clever machine that can make sure that the pressure is consistent throughout the range of movement, and also that the contraction itself is at the same speed, causing that pressure on the movement too. So, reciprocal inhibition. Before we start, let's look at this phrase. It sounds really confusing, but again, as I do many times, let's break the words down. Reciprocal, where have you heard that before? Reciprocate. If you reciprocate something, it means you give back, you do something in tandem with somebody else or something else. Inhibition simply means inhibiting something, stopping something from working. So, reciprocal inhibition, working in tandem to stop something from working. What's working in tandem? antagonistic muscle pairs. Antagonistic muscle pairs are simply two opposite muscles that work together where one contracts, one relaxes. You may have learned that phrase in GCSE PE, you may not have done. What we have there is we have an extensor and a flexor. We have an agonist and an antagonist. Easy way of differentiating between them two, when a muscle contracts and you did lots of exercises, let's say in the gym, your muscle would start to hurt and it is, you could argue, in agony. So an easy way to remember which one is the prime mover, which one is contracting, it's the agonist. The antagonist is the one that is relaxing. With an extensor and a flexor, what we're looking at is, as it sounds, which muscle is causing flexion or which muscle is causing extension. So in a bicep curl, the bicep is the flexor, in a tricep, tricep extension, the tricep is the extensor. So it's not that one contracts and one relaxes, they can both contract, it depends what the outcome is, either flexion or extension. So let's look at an example. As the agonist contracts, the antagonist relaxes. Both muscles cannot contract at the same time. It is impossible. One of the muscles is inhibited. Of course this could be and vice versa, so the extensor could be the muscle that's contracting, therefore the flexor could be relaxing. Just to go back to that example I shared earlier with the bicep, the bicep muscle contracts to cause flexion at the elbow. Whilst this happens, the tricep muscle relaxes. Now the tricep muscle lengthens whilst the bicep is shortening in the bicep curl. So therefore the tricep is the extensor and it is relaxing. It is also the antagonist. The bicep is the agonist, the flexor that is contracting. Of course this can be done in reverse. The tricep can contract to cause extension, the extensor, the agonist. As you can see as the bicep relaxes, it is the antagonist it is opposite to the agonist, which is the moving muscle, the contracting muscle causing movement of the joints. This process is known as reciprocal inhibition. There's many antagonistic pairs across the body. You can do the latissimus dorsi and the pectoralis major. You could do hamstring and quadricep muscles. You could do abdominal muscles with lower back muscles. There are many examples that you can use, but the main one, the obvious one, is the bicep and the tricep working as an antagonistic pair. It is impossible for both muscles to concentrically contract at the same time. So 4.2.4 wants us to put the muscles alongside the movements we looked at in 4.2.1. It's important to do this separately. So if you're unsure of the movements, go back to 4.2.1, watch it again so you understand each movement that takes place. Now let's look at adding in 
the muscles that are responsible for their movements. We're going to start from the ground up. I'm going to start at the ankle joint. Two movements, plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. But when we plantar flex, our gastrocnemius muscle contracts, bringing us up to our tiptoes. And when we dorsiflex, it's our tibialis anterior that causes dorsiflexion at the ankle joint. If we move up from the ankle joint to the knee, we have two movements. We have flexion and extension. Flexion is caused by the hamstring muscle contracting, really reducing that joint angle behind the leg. Extension is caused by the quadricep, which allows us to return to our anatomical position of standing up straight. Moving up to the hip, we have two different movements we're gonna look at here. So firstly, we have the hip flexors. Now there are a number of muscles associated with hip flexion, but if you have to put one down in an exam, you're gonna write your psoas major. That is the main muscle responsible for hip flexion, iliopsoas muscle. Extension of the leg takes place from the glutes muscle, the gluteus maximus, and that muscle contracts to extend at the hip, bringing our leg back in. And then at the elbow, we have the bicep contracting to cause flexion and the tricep contracting to cause extension. Nice and simple at the elbow. Up to the shoulder, we look at the deltoid muscle, which is responsible for many movements here. And we have the anterior deltoid, which is helping to be responsible for flexion. Extension is caused by our latissimus dorsi, bringing our muscle back in, our lateral, Deltoid is responsible for abduction, and adduction is assisted by the pectoralis major. And then the movement's responsible at our shoulder. What I want us to think about, when we're in this position, and we're doing a lat pull down, just know that the arm, if that was straight, would be adducting. So it's still the latissimus dorsi that is responsible for bringing the arm back in. So it's adding it to the body. So that is still the movement, which is why your latissimus dorsi is your, your prime mover when you're doing a pull. -up. If you're looking for sports science teaching resources, visit the TES website or the Teachers Pay Teachers website. Links are in the description below. There you can pick up a range of sports science PowerPoints, including this unit, topic four, and specifically topic 4.2. Good luck with your studies, all the best in the future.